This is the record that God has given to us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. He who believes on him is not condemned, but he who believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. For there is no other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For of him, and through him, and to him, are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Before we begin our study, let's go to the Lord and ask his guidance and direction on our study today. Father, we are, again, so thankful we have your word, that in your word you reveal to us who you are, you reveal to us who we are, and you reveal to us how we are to have a relationship with you. And how, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to uh, come into your presence in prayer and the importance of prayer in our spiritual life. That prayer is the primary vehicle for communication with you, and it is through prayer that we are able to bring our uh, petitions and intercessions uh, to your throne of grace. Now, Father, as we continue our study of this great prayer Uh, by Hezekiah and the answer that you gave him. We pray that you would challenge us with the reality that we too have an even greater position of prayer because of our position in Christ, because he has uh, torn down and removed the veil, and because we have immediate access to your throne of grace. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 19. Last time, we just looked at the opening part of Hezekiah's prayer, the way he addressed God. In his address to God, we see that it is not just a formal recitation of certain titles or certain names related to God, but that the use of those names and those titles are designed to uh, bring before God the reality of his covenant relationship With Israel, and to emphasize the fact that he, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, stands in a position as the unique God of the universe. He is the creator God of the universe, and as the creator God of the universe, he is sovereign or he is in authority over all of history, over the kingdoms of man, and over the destiny of these kingdoms. And I stressed at the end last time uh, two or three points that I want to remind you of today before we go forward. First thing that sort of overrode everything that I taught last time is the principle that that is stated at the end of James 4, verse 2, that we have not because we ask not. If you look at Hebrew, I mean at 2 Kings uh, 19, verse 20, When Isaiah begins to relay to Hezekiah the answer that God gave to his prayer, God says, Because you have prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. I think that's important to stress because so often today people forget to pray or we pray so casually because somehow we get infected with a human viewpoint concept of fatalism that somehow God's just going to do what God's going to do, and my prayer life really doesn't change things. And yet, again and again in Scripture, we see examples of how our prayers do change things, uh, and God does intervene in the normal affairs of human history. Now, Having said that, as I looked at those, uh, um, those, uh, the introductory address to God there in verse 15, we see first of all that Hezekiah emphasizes the uniqueness of God 
And we saw that the uniqueness of the God of Israel cannot be separated from his identification with the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant, the names that are used there for God, emphasizing that he is uh, Yahweh, the uh, God of Israel, uh, the one who dwells between the cherubim, is a reminder that God had entered into a covenant relationship with the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so this is the basis for why Hezekiah comes to him to deliver and save the people in this time of crisis. And so when we apply that into our own uh, into our own thinking and our own prayer life, we need to think in terms of what is God's covenant relationship with us that is the foundation of our relationship to him. And that, of course, would be the new covenant and the death of Christ on the cross. The second thing I pointed out was that the uniqueness of the God of Israel cannot be distinguished or separated from his role as the creator God who therefore has the right to rule in human history, emphasizing the fact that God as creator and the doctrine of creation as it is laid out in the scripture is not just some secondary doctrine, but this is at the very core of what distinguishes the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from all of the other so-called gods and goddesses and all of the pantheons of all of the world's religions, that only the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob stands completely distinct and separate from the creation. He's not part of the creation. He's not part of that uh, chain of being, as Aristotle named it, uh, that just makes him a part of of everything else. He's not just a he's he's just a bigger. Uh, entity than man. He just has more power, etc., not as the Bible describes as being something totally distinct. I referenced Exodus chapter 20, uh, verses 8 through 11, which is the longest of the uh, commandments in the, in the Ten Commandments, emphasizing the fact that uh, the sign of the Mosaic Covenant, the observance of the Sabbath day, the Shabbat, is grounded in the pattern of the creation week. And if the creation week wasn't a literal six, 24-hour consecutive day creation week, then this commandment becomes virtually meaningless. The Mosaic law and the sign of the Mosaic law is grounded on a literal six, 24-hour consecutive day creation week. And this is not just unique to the Exodus 20 passage, but it's reiterated, as I pointed out, in various other uh, passages of Scripture as well. So creation is foundational to our understanding of who the God is to whom we pray. Third point was that prayer presumes the, that God has the right to interview, intervene in our lives and intervene in history and change things. And he can do so because he is above and beyond history. He's outside of creation, and he is the sovereign ruler of creation. That What's embedded in that as a presupposition is that God is the creator and has the right uh, to answer prayer in that way. So the conclusion I presented last time was that prayer to the sovereign God of Israel is based on the literal reality of the Genesis account of creation. We pray to the Creator. Now when we get into a little further into our study in Acts on Tuesday nights, we'll come to a prayer in Acts chapter 4, where after John and Peter have been arrested, and then they're brought before the Sanhedrin, and they're intimidated and... uh, uh, bullied by the uh, religious authorities in Jerusalem and before they're finally released, when they go back to the other disciples in Jerusalem and to the other believers in Jerusalem and give a report to them, then they pray to God. And the first thing they say when they pray to God is that they are praying to the God who made the heavens and the earth and the seas and all that is in them. And so we see even in the New Testament that the doctrine of God as the creator is fundamental to our address to God as uh, in prayer. And so this is the foundation for this prayer. God has the right to intervene in the affairs of mankind. Now, when we come to the 16th verse here, we see that it, the uh, expression of the petition itself. In verse 16, there is a cry to God 
to call upon him to listen and to pay attention, and then this begins to then the uh, then Hezekiah begins to outline just exactly what the problem is that Judah faced, or that Ju- the kingdom of Judah faced as a as their problem. In verse sixteen, he says, "Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see." And hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Now, the use of the word ear and eyes, uh, hearing and seeing, are what's referred to as anthropomorphisms. An anthropomorphism is a figure of speech that uses or attributes to God a human form or human physical attribute that God doesn't actually possess in order to uh, illustrate or to make clear in uh, human in a human frame of reference uh, the plans or policies of God, and so we'll read about uh, God's eyes. Usually, that relates to knowledge and what God sees. Seeing is often um, used metaphorically to emphasize uh, learning, the acquisition of knowledge, and hearing is as well. It is not that God is unaware of what is going on. But in this kind of expression, we see that God is, is referred to this way frequently in the Psalms as a way to express the immediate urgency of the situation. Uh, for example, in Psalm 17.6, the psalmist says, I have called upon you, for you will hear me, O God. Incline your ear to me and hear my speech. Psalm 31, 2, we read, Bow down your ear to me, deliver me speedily, be my rock of refuge, a fortress of defense to save me. And in Psalm 102, verse 2, we read, Do not hide your face from me in the day of my trouble. Incline your ear to me in the day that I call, answer me speedily. And so in each of these examples and many more I could go to, we see that the one who is praying and calling upon God is expressing the urgency of the situation. There is a pressing need, and God needs to pay attention to it and intervene right now. And so he uses these figures of speech in order to express to God the the immediate uh, <coughs> the immediate requirement of the situation. And so he says, Hezekiah says, incline your ear, O Lord. It has the, the idea of incline as the idea of bend over, lower your ear so you can hear me uh, more quickly and more readily. Incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And then again, we come back to the hearing. Hear the words of Sennacherib. And in the King James, it uses the word reproach, but it has the idea in the Hebrew of a taunt or a boast, or he is God is being ridiculed, his character is being brought into question, his very existence is being, um, uh, is being challenged. And in fact, Sennacherib is insulting the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by saying that your God's no better than any of these other gods. And as I've pointed out again and again in our study since we got into this in the 18th chapter, is that this is the challenge that comes across from the world system in so many different ways. How can you really trust God? How can you really believe in God? And so Hezekiah is calling upon God in this prayer to stand up for himself. It's not a prayer that's grounded in, God, I have this need, you need to come rescue me. It is fundamentally, Lord, your very character, uh, your integrity, your promises are at stake here, and so you need to come and intervene in order to defend your honor. That is the, that is the foundation of his, his petition to God. And so then he rehearses the circumstances and the situation in verses 17 and 18. He says, Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands. Now, this doesn't come across so clearly in the way uh, it is expressed here in 2 Kings chapter 19, but there is a parallel passage in Isaiah chapter 37 from verse uh, 20 and following that covers almost the same incident and same events. And there it is clear that what is taking place here is that the the actions, the 
uh, imperial um, advance of Assyria has not only laid waste to foreign nations, but because they have had to put such a large military into the field, it has drawn on so much of the natural resources of the empire that it and it and in terms of not only finances but in terms of people that it has laid waste to uh, the farms and the industry back at home, and so it has created a situation of instability uh, back in the in the core area uh, of Assyria, so that their uh, their advance has not only laid waste uh, these nations that they have conquered but also has had a negative impact back in the homeland. They have laid waste the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they destroyed them. And this shows that at the root of the Assyrian attitude is arrogance, arrogance towards God because they have rejected the true God. At God consciousness, they had substituted these idols of wood and metal and and stone, and now they have rejected those, recognizing the gods have no power, so they 've destroyed those and Once you remove uh, an external god from your thinking, then something else is going to move into that vacuum, and what usually moves into the vacuum uh, uh, created by the absence of God or a god is man, and we put ourselves in a position of ultimate authority, and so we just become more and more arrogant. And this is what had taken place with uh, Assyria, not recognizing that their very power, their very uh, expansion had been as a result of the sovereign plan of God, which is what God points out when he answers this prayer in the coming verses. So then in verse 19, Hezekiah now expresses his petition. Uh, his petition to God, uh, expressing specifically what he is calling upon God to do. He says, Now therefore, O Lord our God, he reiterates the uh, name for God, Yahweh, which he uses three times in this uh, opening, or four times in this opening section, emphasizing the covenant relationship that God had on the basis of the Mosaic covenant with Israel. He says, O Lord our God, I pray, save us. This is the Hebrew verb yasha, which is the root of the name for Jesus, Yeshua, or the name Joshua, that all of these come out of the same root word, which means to save or to deliver. In some cases, it is applied in a spiritual sense to ultimate salvation, but in many cases, it just refers to either physical healing or physical deliverance. And in this case, it is physical deliverance from the enemy. So he's calling upon uh, the Lord to deliver us from his hand, that is, the hand of Sennacherib. And the reason he gives is that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, you alone. So he, he grounds his petition not on the need of Judah or the need of uh, Hezekiah or the inhabitants of Jerusalem, but on the very character of God. God, your character has been challenged by by this uh, blasphemous king. It is your character, your existence that is being brought into question. And because of that, you need to intervene in this situation so that your uh, character is no longer blasphemed and people will know that you and you alone are God. And that is one of the ways in which we ought to think through the petitions and um, uh, intercessions that we bring before God is on what basis should God answer this prayer? What is the scriptural reason that God should intervene into this situation? Uh, not simply because uh, if he intervenes somehow this will provide a good testimony, but because, for example, in a case of someone uh, who has a fatal disease or someone who has some other a problem of that nature, what makes this uniquely a challenge to the, to the character of God? 
And in most cases, those do not present that kind of a unique challenge. People who live within a fallen world, the devil's world, are going to be susceptible to various diseases and failures and calamities. But it is only in the few rare circumstances where the very character existence of God is on display and is at the core of the situation. And so we need to think carefully about how we present these kinds of petitions to God and these kinds of arguments to him. But see, this isn't just the kind of uh, superficial, spontaneous prayer, O oh Lord, help and deliver me, but it represents a thought-out prayer on the basis of God's promise to preserve and protect the nation. And that is what becomes the issue at stake. And so then God answers, and he answers through the prophet Isaiah, and we're told in verse 20 that um, Isaiah, the son of Amoz, sent to Hezekiah saying, Thus says the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim of Israel, Because you have prayed to me against Sennacherib king of Assyria, I have heard. And so God is going to respond uh, efficaciously to this prayer request. He hears all prayers, but... In this sense, he is hearing with a response to answer the prayer positively. And then in verse 21, uh, Isaiah begins to announce the word of the Lord. Again, I want you to notice that the prophet is saying this is the word of the Lord. This isn't Isaiah's understanding of how God might operate. He is claiming to speak on the... Uh, and to give objective revelation from the very God of heaven. The scripture is not man's words about God, but claims to present to us the very words of God to us. It is objective, real revelation. It's not something that uh, man's imagination uh, just developed. Well, as we get into this section, the answer the, uh, to the prayer, there are three basic sections to this uh, to this answer. The first is what is shaped uh, in terms of the literature of, of the day as a taunt or a mocking song. It uses a certain kind of meter in Hebrew that, ex- that is typical of that kind of uh, a taunt where God is going to ridicule the, uh, the abilities of Sennacherib, and he's going to put Sennacherib down as just some minor uh, character on the uh, on the stage of history, who doesn't even recognize that ultimately it is God himself who is working behind the scenes to bring about his will uh, in history. And so this this taunt or this mocking song uh, is presented in verses 20 uh, through 28. A simple uh, statement is made at the very beginning that we read in verse 21, which refers to Jerusalem as a whole under the image of a virgin, the daughter of Zion. Verse 21, God begins his answer by saying, uh, The virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised you, you being Sennacherib. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised you, laughed you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head behind her back. Now, Zion, or Jerusalem, is called a virgin here because this city has never been conquered as the capital of of, uh, Judah. The city has never been uh, conquered or destroyed. And so the, uh, the emphasis here is that this, this city has never been taken, because, and the implication is because God is the one who has protected uh, Jerusalem. Because of that, and because of their relationship of the people to Yahweh, uh, they have despised Sennacherib. They have laughed at the things that he has said. And the image of shaking her head behind uh, the back of a person it indicates derision and pleasure and a lack of respect for the person. And so God is mocking uh, Sennacherib, who thinks that he is so great and powerful because of all the conquests that he has made. But yet here he comes to Jerusalem, and they are just uh, laughing at him. They're ridiculing him behind his back, and that he is really nothing. In verse 22, we go on to read uh, the God speaking, saying, Whom have you reproached uh, and blasphemed? 
And the question there is a rhetorical question that is designed to make the point to Sennacherib and to say, who is it that you have really blasphemed here? Who is it that you're ridiculing? Who is it that you are deriding? Um, Against whom have you made loud your voice? And raise your eyes on high. Uh, The translation there in the New King James is a superior translation. Some people translate this, lifted up your eyes with your haughty eyes. Uh, The haughtiness or the arrogance comes into play in the next verse. Uh, The the word there that's translated on high just means that they've lifted, he's lifted his eyes and looked up heavenward. It is not a term that refers to uh, arrogance or haughtiness. So God is saying, whom is it that you've reproached and blasphemed? Who is it that you have raised your voice against and lifted your eyes uh, heavenward, as it were? And then the answer is, against the Holy One of Israel, indicating that he is distinct. The word holy in Hebrew is not a word that emphasizes moral purity, but that which is distinct or separate or unique. So again, we have this emphasis on the uniqueness of God, that he is the Lord God, the Lord alone. He stands completely in contrast to all of his creation, and he is unique and distinct from all of these other gods and goddesses that human beings create. In verse 23, we read uh, of the uh, boast that uh, Sennacherib made. God says, by your messengers you have reproached the Lord. Again, using a, another word that is a synonym for blasphemy or ridicule. You have ridiculed God. You have put down the Lord. You, you have said, and this is, uh, kind of reminds me of Isaiah 14 when uh, the Lord speaking to Lucifer says, you have said in your heart. And so that's what this represents is the mental attitude, the thinking that under, underlies the, the boastfulness and the arrogance of Sennacherib. Uh, his thinking was, by the multitude of my chariots, in other words, I have such great military power and such tremendous technology, and I have more chariots and more horsemen, and they, my, my cavalry is better supplied and better trained than any other nation in the world, and there's no one who can stand against me. That represents the thinking of Sennacherib. He said, By the multitude of my chariots, I have come up to the height of the mountains, to the limits of Lebanon. And so this emphasizes his his uh, his power. He has uh, invaded down from the north, down through Lebanon. Uh, the size of his army was such that he that they had to cut down forests just to provide the the wood for the army. And so they devastated various forests as they came down through Lebanon, cutting down tall cedars, uh, cypress trees. And then he says, I will, um, this is the thought of Sennacherib, I will enter the extremity of its borders to its fruitful forest. So he's emphasizing how uh, how powerful he is as he came down through, uh, th- brought his army down uh, from the north through Lebanon and just destroying everything and conquering uh, everything. And then in verse 24, he says, I have dug and drunk strange water. Well, what in the world does that mean? And with the soles of my feet, I have dried up all the brooks of defense. And what this is talking about is that as the As the army moved south, they needed water, and so they had to uh, dig wells, uh, which uh, they had such a a need for water that even the wells that they dug uh, dried up. And as they took water out of the various uh, uh, brooks and uh, uh, areas where there was water runoff, uh, they just dried up the water sources because they, they just sucked it all up. He says, I have dug and drunk strange water, um, and with the soles of my feet I've dried up all the brooks of defense. And then we come down into uh, verse 25, and we read where God answers him now. Verses 23 and 24 express the arrogant boasting of Sennacherib. And verse 25, we see God's answer. Now in God's answer, God is stressing 
that he is ultimately the one who rules over the affairs of men. Now, in this answer, what this brings out for us is the age-old conundrum of the sovereign will of God versus the individual free will of man. And I'm not going to go into extended doctrinal discussion of that, but these things are both true. God rules over history to bring about that which he intends. And at the same time, he gives man within a limited framework freedom to choose and to chart the course of his own life on the basis of his own volition and his own decisions. I think where we get into problems is when we start trying to define the causative relationship of God's will on human history in terms of creature, creaturely causation. When we look at how causation works in the creaturely realm, we extrapolate that back to the divine realm, and we try to define God's acts of causation on human history in terms of the same categories in the same way that human causation works, and that's where we create a, a problem. God is wise enough and powerful enough to rule in the affairs of men without violating human freedom and human responsibility, and to do so without making man into a puppet, so that when man makes decisions, he makes those decisions freely and on his own terms, and yet when it is over with, as we see here, it is seen to be exactly what God intended. Sennacherib on his own, made the decisions he made to be who he uh, was going to be and to rise up and to uh, set himself up in arrogance against God. That was his decision. That was not God's decision. God is not morally culpable for that. And yet, when all is said and done, we realize that God, in his sovereignty, uh, allowed and intended for uh, Assyria to rise as a powerful nation in order that God would use them to bring discipline uh, and, 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 and cursing upon the northern kingdom of Israel in their destruction and now in bringing, um, in, in bringing this invasion into the southern kingdom of Judah. So God is going to emphasize this by raising another uh, rhetorical question. Verse 25, he says to uh, Sennacherib, he says, Did you not hear long ago how I made it from ancient times that I formed it? Here we have two of the four key words used in the Hebrew Bible for, uh, for creation. I saw how I made it. This is a general word for doing or making or manufacturing something. And the second word translated formed in the third line is the Hebrew word yatser, indicating the kind of forming or shaping as a potter shapes the clay. And so God says, Did you not hear long ago how I made it, how from ancient times I formed it? Now I have brought it to pass. So those first two lines indicate the it there indicates the pl God's plan for history, how I originally designed this plan from eternity past, and now I have brought it to pass that you should be for the crushing of fortified cities into heaps of ruins. So Sennacherib is fulfilling the plan of God, even though he has made these decisions himself, and he is not aware at all that God is uh, uh, orchestrating history. Nevertheless, God is fully in control. Sennacherib and no human being can operate uh, outside of the sovereign will of God. So verse 26 states, Therefore God says their inhabitants had little power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field and the green herb, as the, as the grass on the housetops and grain blighted before it's grown. But I know, God says, your dwelling place, your going out and your coming in, and your rage against me. What God is emphasizing here is that he is the one in control. He is the one who allowed uh, Assyria to uh, to develop its military power. He is the one who allowed Assyria to have its victories over all of these other nations and countries. He is, and that it is under God's sovereign will that uh, Assyria and Sennacherib were raised up to this uh, position of power, and God was not unaware of his existence. 
Verse uh, 28 continues the thought, because your rage against me and your tumult, and that word translated in the New King James as tumult, is a uh, Hebrew word, shanan, sha'anan, meaning arrogance, says, because of your rage against me and your arrogance has come up to my ears, therefore I will put my hook into your nose and my bridle in your lips, and I will turn you back by the way which you came. Again, this is showing that God is going to intervene in history in a way that is going to pull Sennacherib back home and away from uh, Judah. He is going to turn him around uh, by way of utilizing circumstances. God's not going to physically grab him and manipulate him, but through the pressure of certain circumstances, it will force Sennacherib to take only one course of action. There's only one way in which he can respond to what God is going to do, and that is to return home. And that is often how God directs history, by working through circumstances so that People are left with limited options, not because he forces their will to go in a certain direction, but because the options that they perceive to be available to them or the options that are truly available to them are limited by God so that the individual will take only one course of action. This is how God rules in the affairs of men. So he, God says, I will put my hook in your nose and my bridle in your lips. I will turn you back by the way which you came. And then in verse 29, there is a shift uh, to uh, addressing uh, Hezekiah. In this shift, there is now a promise of deliverance to Hezekiah. Uh, this shall be a sign to you, and a sign is usually a miraculous sign of how God is going to act on behalf of someone in a positive way. And he says to Hezekiah, this will be the sign to you, you shall eat this year such as grows of itself. Why? They, Judah has been uh, under the invasion of the Assyrian army. They, industry has broken down, agriculture has broken down, the farmers haven't been able to go out into the fields and to plow and to work and to harvest because of the presence of these enemy troops. And so whatever grows is whatever just happened to grow in the fields uh, left over from uh, the seeding, the natural seeding from the crops the year before. So God says this year, this, that's talking about the first year, uh, this year, such as grows of itself. In the second year, that is next year, what springs from the same. In other words, the economic devastation on the southern kingdom of Judah was such that, that it didn't just affect this immediate time of the invasion, but it would also have consequences into the coming uh, year and even into the third year. For God says, also in the third year, sow and reap. It's going to be two years down the road, not just this year or next year, but the third year down the row before they are able to, their economy is going to return to normal and before they are able to uh, sow and reap as under normal conditions. Now what happens when uh, Sennacherib is defeated and he leaves, the whole army doesn't get killed. That There were many more troops than the ones that were surrounding Jerusalem. And so the, there were ongoing consequences to this invasion that lasted uh, for the next couple of years. But the promise is that in the third year, things will begin to return to normal. They could plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. And the remnant who have escaped, and this is the promise from God, the remnant who have escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. Now that wasn't going to happen in the next month or the next year or even the second year out. That won't happen till thir the third year out when prosperity would begin to return. You, even in the ancient world, economies could not be turned around overnight. It took time for these things to reverse themselves once uh, various actions had uh, had been engaged in, in this case, the results of this military action. It took at least uh, three years before the economy began to grow again. And so the prosperity of the people is indicated by the imagery of a plant that it would, they would take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem, there is this promise, uh, shall go a remnant. Now, the term remnant is never used outside of the Old Testament. It's a technical word 
for the believers within the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It's never used in the New Testament. It's never used in reference to church-age believers. The doctrine of the remnant is a a concept that is unique to those who were under the Mosaic law and those were in, who were in the house of Israel. And it refers to that minority within Israel who were believers and who, were, who trusted in God and who did not go along with the idolatry and the rebellion against God that characterized Israel at certain times. For out of Ju- Jerusalem, God promised, shall go a remnant And those who escape from Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And so in that last phrase, God says it is his character that is going to provide this this victory, this promise, and will provide a future hope for the nation. And then he, so that is the promise in verses 29 to 31 of how God is going to deliver Israel. And then in verses 32 to 34, we have the promise related to how, what he is going to do to the king of Assyria. There he writes, Therefore thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor build a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and he shall not come into this city." And so there's a specific prophecy given here that there will not be an attack on the city of Jerusalem. They are, which is covered in those first three stanzas, he shall not come into the city, shoot an arrow there, or come before it with a shield. Furthermore, he's not going to build a siege mound against it. Now there was a, the city was surrounded, but they hadn't put up the breastworks and the siege mounds against the city. But before that happened, uh, God says he will return by the way he came. That is, uh, Sennacherib would return uh, from the way in which he came. And why does God answer this way? Uh, Verse 34, For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the, the sake of my servant David. In other words, again, God's intervention is based on a covenant. He is going to preserve the Davidic dynasty. Remember, Hezekiah is in the line of David. He is a descendant of David. God has promised that one of David's descendants would sit on the throne of Jerusalem forever and ever. And so in order to preserve the Davidic line and the Davidic dynasty, and so that God will be faithful to his covenant, God promised to defend and protect Israel. Uh, protect the city. And so then we read the how this is fulfilled just shortly thereafter in verses 35 to 37. And here the writer of Kings describes it. Now everything up to 34 is the answer that God gave, the promise he gave to answer Hezekiah's prayer. And now in verse 35, the writer of Kings tells us how this was fulfilled. And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord, this is the pre-incarnate, pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ, that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000, as the pre-incarnate Christ, of course, the second person of the Trinity, is uh, going to be called the Prince of Peace. One of the ways that you have peace is to destroy the enemy. And so he brings peace to the kingdom of Judah by completely annihilating the army that was outside of Jerusalem. Now, there have been a number of studies that have been done which indicate that and suggest that the army of Assyria that was in Judah was much larger than this. This is why there were such problems back home, is they had virtually brought all of the males that they could into the army in order to uh, conquer all these various territories. Now, there were more uh, Assyrians in Judah than 185,000, but there were 185,000 who were involved in the siege around uh, around Jerusalem, and it's those 185,000 that were wiped out. Now, before this happened, Sennacherib uh, fled, and one of the reasons that it is believed that he fled was that he heard a rumor about a potential coup against his throne back in Nineveh. Uh, Nineveh is the 
uh, capital of the Assyrian Empire, and so he had to depart from uh, his invading army down in Judah and go back to Nineveh in order to make sure that his throne and his power uh, was secure. So first he left, and then shortly thereafter, the angel of the Lord came into the camp of the Assyrians at night and killed every single one of those who were surrounding uh, Jerusalem. And in the morning they woke up and they were all dead, nothing but dead bodies. They, they had all of their equipment, all of their arms, everything were there. And so those in Jerusalem could take all of that weaponry and make it their own. And the army was, was gone. And this ended uh, the threat to the, the uh, kingdom of Judah. So we read in verse 36, So Sennacherib king of Assyria departed and went away, returned home, and remained at Nineveh. Now verse 37 takes place sometime later. Uh, in fact, it takes place about 12 years later when there is another uh, threat to the throne. We're told in verse 37, as, as Sennacherib was worshiping in the temple of Nisroch, his god, this was a god uh, indicated by the form of an eagle, an eagle god, that his sons Adrimelech and Sherezer struck him down with the sword. At this point, what had happened was that Sennacherib had bypassed these two older sons in order to pass the throne down to his third son, Esar Haddon. And so out of jealousy, these two older, uh, older sons uh, assassinated him as he was in the temp temple of the eagle god worshiping. They killed him, and then they escaped into the land of Ararat, that is the area of northeastern uh, Turkey. And then afterward, uh, Esar Haddon uh, took his place as the king of Assyria. And so again, we see uh, a tremendous example of the uh, of Scripture and the veracity of Scripture, that the prophecies that God gives are come true uh, precisely as He described that they would. That these are not simply things that are made up. These are not simply things uh, that people wrote down because they had some sort of uh, uh, emotional encounter with a God. But that in, indeed, what is happening is that God acts in history and does intervene in history. And in the same way, God can act and intervene in our lives, maybe not as dramatically, uh, maybe not in the way that all of your enemies will die in a single night, but God will intervene in such a way that he protects and defends us um, because we are members of the body of Christ, and on that basis we come to him uh, we come to him in prayer. And so we can learn a tremendous lesson in this that God does change things. Prayer to God changes things. God does intervene in history. And this is why prayer is to be a priority in our lives, not just something we do on occasion, but something that is to be a top priority in our life. It's to be our priority individually as well as uh, corporately as a body of believers. This is why we have a prayer meeting on uh, Tuesday nights before Bible class, also why monthly we have uh, the ladies come together for a ladies' uh, prayer time. It is important for the people in the body of Christ to come together and to pray to the Lord. Now, in conclusion today, uh, as we wrap up our study of this uh, Syrian threat, on uh, Judah, I want to read from a poem that was written by George Gordon, Lord Byron, that uh, is on the Assyrian, called The Destruction of Sennacherib. The Assyrian came down, and, and notice how accurate he was to the scriptures. He says, The Assyrian came down like the wolf on the fold, and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold, and the sheen of their spears was like stars on the sea, when the blue wave rolls nightly on deep Galilee, like the leaves of the forest when summer is green, that host with their banners at sunset were seen, like the leaves of the forest when autumn hath blown, that host on the morrow lay withered and strown. For the angel of death spread his wings on the blast and breathed in the face of the foe as he passed, and the eyes of the sleepers waxed deadly and chill, and their hearts but once heaved and forever grew still. 
And there lay the steed with his nostril all wide, but through it there rolled not the breath of his pride. And the foam of his gasping lay white on the turf, and cold as the spray of the rock-beating surf. And there lay the rider distorted and pale, with the dew on his brow and the rust on his mail. And the tents were all silent, the banners alone, the lances unlifted, the trumpets unblown. And the widows of Asher are loud in their wail, and the idols are broke in the temple of Baal. And the might of the Gentile, unsmote by the sword, hath melted like snow in the glance of of the Lord. Let's bow our heads together and close in prayer. Father, we are thankful that you are the God who intervenes in history, not just in terms of the broad spectrum of history as we see in this episode, but also in the history of our individual lives, that you answer our prayers, that when we call upon you, you do, uh, you do intervene in the details of our life, and that there is no situation or circumstance or event that is too small for your attention or too small for us to bring before you. James says we have not because we ask not, and we often ask not simply because we don't really believe that uh, the affairs of our lives are worthy to bring before you, or somehow we uh, become convinced that whatever is going to happen is going to happen, and we yield to some sort of fatalism. Yet, Father, the lesson that we learn from this is that when we pray, you do listen And even though at times the answer is no, there are other times when you are waiting for us to call upon you so that you can intervene in our lives and demonstrate your love and your grace to us and to answer our prayers with a strong affirmative. Father, we pray too this morning that if there's anyone here who is not sure of their salvation or not certain of their eternal destiny, that they would take this opportunity to make that sure and certain. In your grace, you have provided us with a perfect salvation, a salvation in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins, who is our substitute, and took upon himself the judicial penalty for all of our sin, and that simply by believing in him, we can have eternal life. Father, we pray that as we uh, sit here this morning, that if there is anyone here who has never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, that right now they would recognize that that need, the importance of that act. That is, the moment you believe that Jesus died for you, at that instant, God knows what you're trusting in, and at that instant, you are justified, you're regenerated, and you become a new creature in Christ. Father, we pray that you would challenge each of us with the importance and the priority of prayer, and that we may be diligent in our coming before your throne of grace, not just on a uh, erratic uh, schedule, but on a regular a schedule where we set aside time that we might focus on you and bring our petitions and our supplications before you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.